Well, today we're going to continue our series in Luke, where I'm so excited. We're at the, right at the very beginning of this thing, and we're going to be going through the book of Luke all the way through Easter. Now, right now, we're doing kind of a matrix, slow motion, almost, almost, almost ground to a halt in chapters 1 through 3 through the, Easter, uh, through the Christmas season. And then on d- December 26, we're going to pick up the pace, and we are going to fly all the way till Easter. And so we're going to be um, covering huge chunks of the book of Luke and kind of putting like ideas with each other and not dealing with it verse by verse. But what I do encourage you to do as we go through this series is read the book of Luke on your own so you can have an idea of what's coming in the given week. If you're interested in it, we have a Bible devotional for the Christmas season that you can download. There'll be a, uh, a actually, if you've got the uh, it's, a, it's an announcement one that says you can get connected and, you know, or just talk to someone. That slide, if you can find it. If you can't, that's fine. But you can scan that if you haven't received it yet, and we'll send it to you. And it, it covers not just the book of Luke, but the other gospel accounts of the birth of Jesus in this time so that you can, you know, kind of come ready for the sermon and know what's going to happen. There aren't going to be many surprises over the next three weeks because we know that Jesus is coming. But to everybody who heard from God in this, for everybody who is participating in what we're going to be studying today, it was a surprise. I mean, it might be be obvious to say this, but I think it's important to say they were not preparing for Christmas. They weren't going to the mall. They didn't know that the birth of the king was imminent. There were no Christmas trees being set up. There were no stockings prepared. There was no story of St. Nicholas. There was no uh, expectation for extravagant spending or extravagant parties or ugly sweaters. None of that was going on in their life at the time. In fact, they were kind of stuck in a slow motion, kind of a groundhog day reality, longing for the time that the Messiah would come and bring about his kingdom in the earth. And that's where these people were. And they were just faithfully serving God, even though they hadn't yet seen the goodness of God fully revealed to them in their generation. They were just hoping and longing. Next week we're going to talk about the consolation, or in two weeks, we're going to talk about the consolation of Israel. That they were longing for the goodness of God to appear in their time and in their families and in their life and in their their community and to their country, to their people, or to their nation, not their country. And so they were sitting here and they they were loving God and they were doing these things and then God appears on the scene. So imagine for a moment that you wake up you're born into the pew, right? Anybody grow up with that reality? Born into church, and you went to kids' church, you went to church three times a day, you know, and like you were at church all week long, and church on Sundays was a massive ordeal, and then, or actually in this case, it'd be church on Saturdays was a big ordeal, and your whole life was structured around the service and worship of God. Now imagine on top of that, you're born into a family that dictates that you're going to be a priest, It dictates that you are going to take on the work of your father and you are also going to serve in the priesthood. There's no other option for you. There's no aptitude tests. There's no no Votech training. There's no option for which career you want to take. You're not choosing your major in college or selecting your degree or jumping degrees because you decide that you don't like it. I had a dentist working on my mouth one time. And as he was working on my mouth, he said, um, like he's all up in my face, all up in my mouth. And he's like, hey, I always thought I'd want to be a dentist. You know, he goes, and I really enjoyed it all the way through school. And he's in my mouth. And I'm like, what is he doing? And he's like, he's like I really don't like it so much after all. And I'm like, God, get out of my mouth. Right? I'm numb. He's cutting on me. He's poking me. And he's like, I really don't like it that much because all through med school it was just science. He's like, I love the science of it. I didn't realize there were going to be so many people, he says, as he's in my mouth. Because the science book, the the textbook didn't didn't scream and cuss and fuss when when they poked him and they bled and when they got the bill. You know, he just imagined a world of dentistry where he was going to get paid and it was going to be easy. And so he he was imagining a career change. There would be no such option for you in this scenario that I'm describing. And you love God and you love your job and you're serving in the temple. And you get married and you find someone who's going to be alongside you for this journey. And they're going to love God with you. You're never going to own any land of your own. Because your job is to serve God and other people are going to provide for you. They're going to supply for you. And you grow up your whole life doing this. But your wife can't have a kid. 
And so now people question your devotion to God because if you were really loving God the way you were supposed to be loving God, you would have a baby because that's how God shows his blessing to people. But you continue to love God and you continue to serve God and you're, you continue to honor God with your life and everything on the outside looks righteous and it looks like you're doing so well, but everything on the outside looks so barren. You don't have the, the possessions of somebody who's favored by God. You don't have the child or the children of people who are blessed by God. And now you've come to an age where it's impossible. Now, even if, you, even, if, even if you could have children at a younger age, now you've passed that time and now you're, you're too old to be able to do it. What would your heart be like? How would you feel after ministering in the temple for years, maybe even decades, feeling like God hadn't answered your prayer? He hadn't blessed you on the outside like you were hoping to be blessed. Maybe some of you identify with that a little bit on your own. Now, we're a very young congregation in terms of our age. So, so if you're like 22 and you're like, I feel like God hasn't really just blessed me on the outside yet, just buckle up. You're young. You're not going to have it yet. Just wait. Life is a lot longer than you realize. But if you're of the more mature in the congregation, and you haven't seen the, the goodness of God appear in the way that you would expect it to, I would say also wait because God might just be setting up something more glorious than you ever could have imagined. And even if it doesn't come to pass the way that you want it to come to pass, there is the reality that God still hears you, God still sees you, and he is still good. And whatever God decides to do in the gap or instead of is for your highest good in the earth. Amen? This is the kind of man who we're about to look at his life. And we're going to look at the life of it. We're actually going to look at two different prophecies. Uh, a prophecy given or a prediction by some Bibles uh, given by the angel gate or a promise, I think, is maybe the most accurate word that starts with B for this. The angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah, who's a priest in the temple. And he's serving, and he appears in the midst of it, makes this promise that, hey, even though you're, you're, you can't produce children, God's going to do a miracle through you and your wife. And then God appears to Mary. And we're going to hear about the promise that the angel Gabriel made to Mary about how she was going to give birth to this person in the line of David. We read it during the Advent moment. We're not going to double-click on the story of Joseph, the story of Joseph, Mary's betrothed. Uh, is actually found in other Gospels. So we don't see Joseph's wrestle or struggle in, in what we're looking at today. But, but it's there nonetheless. And so we know that as Mary was faithful, so was Joseph. Okay, so are you tracking? So we're going to cover a lot of passage today. It's going to be a lot of scripture. So I promise to read it passionately so that it's not boring. I didn't put it up on the screen because I felt like that'd be a bit, it'd be, it'd be a lot to follow along. Um, but, but I promise to read it um, with enthusiasm. We're going to be reading verses 5 through 38. Whew. Whew. You ready? Heather's ready. Is anybody, you guys ready for this? This is going to be great. Now let me say, by, by, way of, by way of preface, reading this is the most important thing that we can do on a Sunday morning together. For entire parts of the Christian church, Christian church history, all they get up, all they do is read it. And let the Spirit of God convict them and challenge them and call them up. And so as I read this, um, and, then, and then we'll break it down. And what I'm going to talk about today is I want to talk about, I want to talk about our talking. And I want to talk about God's timing. Our talking and God's timing. Our talking and God's timing. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. That's a very euphemistic way of saying they were too old. When his division was on duty because he was a priest, 
before God. It happened that while he was chosen according to Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. I'm going to pause right here just to offer some context for what's happening. So as a priest, they were in divisions, and their divisions would serve for periods of time. And during the periods of time that they would serve, different priests were given different responsibilities. And being chosen uh, to go in and light the incense meant that he got to go into, like, the most sacred place, light the incense, and then return to the people and then share a blessing because he had been so close to the presence of God in, in that moment. So he had kind of like, he had the word. He, had, he was the man with, of the moment. And so he goes in to light this incense, which would have been a terrifying thing. I'm told that when people went in to minister before the Lord, they, they wore bells on their ankle in case they died and they just get dragged out. Preaching would be a lot different if I could just die every time I stood up. Right? Just a le- like a rope on my leg. I give it to Trey and he's got to drag me off the stage if I, if I misspeak or if I had like a bad week. I cussed someone on the way to work. So he's going in to do this, and then this remarkable thing's going to happen. The angel of God is going to appear to him. Oh, and one more thought about this. He was chosen by Lot, right? Like, so to the most spiritually kind of mature among us, it seems kind of reckless, right? Because we sometimes we can over, chosen by Lot means that like basically they drew straws. And I'm not sure if he drew the short one or the long one, right? I'm not sure if he was like, sweet, I get to go in and light the incense, or he's like, oh, no. I got to go light the incense. But he was chosen nonetheless. And sometimes we can over spiritualize everything. But they had these people who were called and gifted, and they were like, this is how we'll do it. We'll do it by lot. And that's the tradition that it had been for a couple hundred years at this point. According to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying out, outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear because nobody else should have been in there. And it was an angel of the Lord. That's why I'm saying, like, you don't want angels of the Lord appearing to you. We want the Holy Spirit that descends like a dove. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. And Zechariah's like, which prayer was that? Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and will name him John. Congratulations, you're going to be a dad. You old man. And it was, I'm sure he was as quiet as you are right now. Because he's like, oh, no, no, no. No, no, that was when we were younger. I prayed that in our 20s. We prayed that together in our 30s. We believed for a miracle in our 40s, but no, nah, man, we're good. We've got a good life. We've got, like, we've got plans. Things are good. We're in retirement. I'm just doing this priesthood out of, out of like, generosity of spirit. I, I, we're good. Can you even imagine? I mean, yeah, I, like, I, I've got some friends who, who their son turned 18, moved out of the house, and they got pregnant. Surprise. And they were like, I'm all about, I'm all about it, but I'm not about it. And here Zechariah loves God. He and his wife are righteous. They, they, they have served so well of God and his purposes in the earth. And now this angel shows up and goes, hey, remember that, that prayer that you forgot about, that God didn't forget about? Here you go. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you. Don't get scared. I am so grateful for the prayers that God didn't answer and just moved right on by. I remember this one prayer in particular in my parents' kitchen. I cried out to God. I mean, I was like, I'm going in on this one, Jesus, because I know what you're supposed to do in my life. And I prayed that I would marry this woman who's not Megan. This was when I took Megan's best friend to prom. It was that season. Right? So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so. So imagine this scenario. And I'm like, I say these words out loud. I remember them because it's the most scared I've ever been after praying any prayer ever. Say, God, I don't care if you've got something better for me. That's this is who I want, and this is what I want. Anybody else pray one of those prayers before? No? Yeah? And I am so glad he said no. Now he didn't say no by saying no. I just I prayed the prayer and I was like, oh, that was that was bold. And I was like, was that faith or presumption? 
And now I'm pacing the kitchen, and I'm like, I don't know. Like, does this, what, what, what happens to this prayer? Does it just sit there forever? Or does he, like, just, he stamps it, decides on it, and then moves on? I'm like, I don't even, well, I said it. God, I guess that's what it's going to have to be. So I'm looking forward to you giving me what I asked for. There's a country song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. That's my testimony this morning. But thank God for answered prayers as well. And thank God for the prayers that are answered late. Because sometimes we're just not ready. Now, uh, I won't get all the way into the timing thing yet. but So he prays this. Uh, so the, the, the uh, angel of the Lord comes and tells him, and, and he, <laughs> there will be joy and delight for you. And many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer. Um, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, he's not saying this is a second coming of Elijah. It's just in the same manner that Elijah came. So your son will come and do extraordinary things for God. To turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient of the understanding to the, to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. Zechariah says, how can I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife, my wife is well along in years. You see how masterful that is? He said, I'm old. My wife is well along. <laughs> Little discipleship. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you watch your mouth. <laughs> like, like, this is not like such a happy thing. Like, we're like, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. You know, Zechariah's like, Arguing with an angel. And the angel's like, you don't know who you're talking to right now. I stand in the presence of God, and I'm bringing you this message. I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen. You will become silent and unable to speak until these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he didn't come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. So I, I admire this about Zechariah, that he received this remarkable word, but stayed to the task that God had for him. He continued to serve, and he continued to bless the people, and he continued to stay where he was. He stayed on his post. It's extraordinary to me. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She, that's what you would do if you got pregnant at old age and you were shocked that it was happening. You, you'd be simultaneously blown away and ready to tell everybody and also holding it a little close to the chest just in case something goes wrong. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor uh, in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged or betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel of the Lord came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement. Wondering what kind of greeting this could be. So now this angel of the Lord appears to Mary. A young woman. She's got her whole life in front of her. She's engaged. She's betrothed to this man. And they've already made a legal arrangement for their marriage. For the betrothal to be broken would be the equivalent of getting divorced and would shame both of them. Her, her reputation in her town would be the one who is, who is betrothed. She'd be known by that title. The one who's getting married. The lady who's going to get married, that, that would be the title by which she was known. We're about to learn that Elizabeth, who was barren, is known by the one who's barren. That's how people knew her. So you've got the one that's barren, and you've got the one who's going to be betrothed, who's getting married. And, and, and so we're moving along, and, and the angel of the Lord says, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. 
Every mother thinks this about her children. But Mary's being told this about her child. Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to, to, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel left her. This is God's word to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, with this few moments we have remaining, I ask that you would help us understand more about the power of our words in, in, this, in the relationship between that and your divine timing, according to your love and kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So what we've got is two stories, two very different people, two almost exactly different kinds of people, an old priest and a young woman about to be married. Not young like 25 young, like young teenager young about to get married. And the angel of the Lord appears to them both, and we see two vastly different responses. One calls in to question the reality of the promise. One questions how the the promise will come to pass. We know from the text that the angel Gabriel uh, had discernment to know that Zechariah was asking questions because he didn't believe. But Mary was asking uh, questions because she wanted to know how it was going to happen because she was otherwise disqualified for it. The goal here is not to compare old and young or male and female. But the goal is to maybe see ourselves a little bit in both of them. In one story, God is moving much later than we would anticipate and that we like. In the other story, God is moving so much faster. Like she wasn't blown away by like it was going to be God's child in her. She's like, but I haven't had sex with him. How, how is this going to work? And, and so the, 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 the temptation sometimes when we read scripture is to compare and contrast and be like, well, Zechariah is bad. Because he didn't believe and God punished him and didn't let him speak. Mary's good. She responded in faith and God used her and she, she gave birth to Jesus, right? Do you have that temptation? A little bit? No, nope, just me. I'm the only judgy one. Great. I judge him. I'm like, you know what, Zechariah, you did a bad job. All the way up until this year, I was really judgy of Zechariah. I'm like, God should have told you to shut up. And then I realized that God should have told me to shut up. Because I, I have not believed God a lot more than Zechariah has not believed God. And, and the Bible calls him righteous. And then he struggles. And and the lesson that I learned from Zechariah in this is that even when you're righteous, you can struggle with the promises of God. Even when you're righteous, even when you're following God, even when your whole life and your whole heart is given over to God and his purposes, it can still be a struggle to trust him with the most intimate details of our life. With the, with the hopes that are so, so, so close to our heart. With the hopes that, that seem so far away at the same time. We can trust him with that. And his struggling didn't disqualify him from playing a remarkable role in the nativity story. It didn't, it didn't keep him from participating in the plan of God being fulfilled in his generation. Because without being too graphic, I'd say he went home and he was with his wife. So even though he couldn't speak, he went home and he was with his wife in such a way that pregnancy became available. He had faith and works. (laughs) So he was believing God, but even the righteous can struggle deeply. And I draw a lot of encouragement from that. Anybody here been walking with Jesus for a little while but struggle to trust God because it's taken so long to see things come to pass? If you're not struggling yet, it's because you're not believing yet. I'm shocked at how angry I can get in traffic. Startled. It's jarring to me how angry and selfish I can be to my children and to my, to my wife. It stuns me how selfish I am when it comes to interacting with people in the community and and a fear of running out, even though God has shown himself to be faithful, not just in my life, but in generations and generations and generations of people who have followed him. So I get a lot of really good news for this, but the angel says you got to watch your mouth, Zechariah. So I'm going to watch it for you. 
Now, I had a funny thought this week, and I was like, I was like, I wonder if God prepared Gabriel to know that Zechariah was going to be shocked and a little bit hostile to the idea. Or if Gabriel just showed up and he's like, oh, great. Like, I was literally just beating back the devil, and now you, you shut up. I don't have time, but I don't want to argue with you. I've got to go talk to, i got to go, like, rescue orphans. And you're, like, going to argue with me about this thing that you want. Right? Or, like, he got back to heaven after he did it. And he's up in heaven with, with Michael and the other archangels. And they're like, how'd it go, Gabriel? And they're like, hey, he gave me lips, so I told him to shut up. He's not going to be able to talk until, he, until, he, <laughs> until John comes and he names him. And they were like, hey, that's so awesome. I, that's not in the Bible. But I like to think about what that would have looked like. Because you know, Gabriel had to return back to the throne room and be like, Jesus, I did it. How'd it go, Gabriel? I told him he can't talk. Like, and, and Jesus is like, you don't have the authority. I said, I didn't do it. He just thinks he can't talk. You know, that kind of thing. Is, that's my Bible reading time. Five for five gets wild in my notebook. I've got a side of things that I make up and I wonder about. And then I've got the stuff I can hang my hat on and put the weight of my life on. So welcome to my devotional time. But then you've got Mary who uses her words to seek out additional clarity. Clarity that came, but just in in a short short amount. A very little bit of clarity came, right? He's like, yeah, so God's going to do it. She's like, oh, right, because that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, these aren't cave people who didn't understand pregnancy who didn't understand culture and society and how, thing, how families are, are grown. But she decided to take God at, her, at his word, and she and Joseph move forward together. Next week, we get to see Mary's response, her full response. She's so excited about the promises of God. She moved in faith as well. But we're, we're saving that for next week. The words we use matter. And, and God was silencing Zechariah so that he didn't accidentally derail the work of God in his time and in his generation and, 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 and mess it up. Because he was going to have to go home and be faithful with his wife for that word to be fulfilled. Mary, I, I, wonder, I wonder, did Mary have a choice? Because Gabriel says, this is what's going to happen. And Mary says, be it unto me. I'm the Lord's servant. I'm, a, I'm available to it. That's the kind of heart I want. Don't you want that a little bit? Just when God presses on your heart to be able to say, yeah, absolutely, for your words to affirm the promises of God, for your words to affirm the blessing of God, that when he says, hey, I want you to bless this homeless person, that you go, yeah, you know what, God, I'm going to do that. When he says, you know what, I want you to forgive that person. I need you to do a miracle, and I need you to forgive that person. Um, My spirit is in you, and I'm going to birth forgiveness through you, and families and generations are going to be changed because of it. I want to be the kind of man who says, be it unto me, as you've said. But our words need to line up with our faith and with the purposes of God. Now let's talk about timing. For for Zechariah, it seems so late, and it was so late, and it was impossible. For Mary, it was so early, and it was so early, and it too was impossible. This isn't a matter of, sometimes we're, we're trying to time God, and we're trying to figure out, okay, if it feels like he's late, that means that that it's about to happen, or man, it, it's happening early, so this is God, or maybe God is right in the middle. But the reality is when we feel like God is late, early, or in between, what we're doing is we're inviting God onto our timeline instead of entering into his timeline. Because everything about the timing of God on this whole story is kind of janky. He made the promise in Isaiah that he was going to send a Savior to redeem the world hundreds of years before. And then all of a sudden... He shows up to this old man. So, like, so he's late on a promise, but early to, early to Mary and late on Zechariah, but right on time for all of creation because the timing of his birth was going to line up with the star in the sky that was going to tell the Magi the new king of the Jews has been born. He'd been setting this whole thing up, and so it feels late, and it feels early, but it's right on time for God because he's moving every. He was literally moving the cosmos into space. So that it would announce the birth of Jesus. 
the star, the star in the sky, they believed that it was certain constellations aligned a certain way. And it's stuff that everybody, that, that, that there were these prophecies made about how things were going to align in the sky. And so these magi were watching it because they were interested in, in astrology and they were watching it. And they, hey, there's this people over in the Middle East in, in, in Palestine and they believe that their new king is going to be born when the stars align a certain way. Let's watch for it. And when that happens, let's show up for it because that'd be a pretty big, that'd be a pretty big deal. And then it happens. So Zechariah's like, why am I late? God's like, because freaking Jupiter's in the wrong place. Just wait a second. Because I put these things in orbit, and, and the orbit needs to get to where it needs to get so that you're where you need to be. It's where it needs to be. Mary's where she needs to be because Mary's in one line, Joseph's in the other line, and they actually have to get married for this to work. For Jesus to be in the line of David, he has to be, Joseph has to be the daddy, Mary has to be the mama. Oh, this is miraculous. And, and, and Zechariah's like, hey, you're late on this, God. He's like, I'm moving all of creation to fulfill promises that I've made centuries before. Hold on a moment. And then for Mary, man, it seems so early. But I want to talk real quickly, and I know I'm tight on time, but I want to talk real quickly. Could you go to that chart slide? I want to talk about what happens in our heart that makes us like Zechariah, that even when we're righteous and following God well, we get, we get, we get tied up. This is, a, this is a chart. I've modified it from the original one um, by a guy named Jim. We'll just call him Jim. <laughs> we'll call him Jim because I forgot to write his last name. Henderson, I think, or Hendrickson. But he, he talks about childhood vows and does a lot of psychology work. And he said, this is the process of people, uh, people's lives. And I believe that this is the process that Zechariah went through and that you and I go through all the time without realizing it. You have an experience. You start on the upper left hand. You make meaning of the experience because we have to because we're humans. We make meaning of it. My dog doesn't make meaning of things. There's either food in the dish or there's not. I mean, she's like, she's like she just wants to lick everything, eat everything, and scratches the door when she's got to use the restroom. But we make meaning of it because we're, because we're human and God's given us this creative capacity because we're in his image. He's given us the ability to make meaning of things. You create beliefs and expectations based on the meaning that you create. Here's an example of this. If I walked by you this morning and didn't say hello to you, you, would have, you, you, you gave meaning to it. The meaning you gave to it could either be true or false. You were either like, oh, he's a jerk. He's not talking to me. Or it could just be that I really needed some coffee. I was on my way to get some coffee so that I could be more friendly. Right? But you assign some meaning to our interaction, and then you create belief based on it. And you're like, this guy's a jerk. I'm not going to listen to him when he gets up. Or like, oh, he seems so happy, but, man, he's just a terrible person. And, uh, but... We create meaning, and then we create beliefs and expectations. And so your expectation might be that I never say hi to you because I didn't say hi to you today, and that was your first chance, and I'm a jerk. Then you make decisions and vows concerning future experiences. So now you go, I don't care if he says hi to me. I don't need him to say hi to me. I got my small, groups, my small group leader's better than him anyway. I'm just here for the coffee. This room's too warm or too cold anyway. I think I'm going to go to the other church. Habits and patterns follow uh, habits and patterns form around these decisions and vows. And so you start to live around it. And then what happens is we, we, learn, we live it in the opposite and we begin to live out of the vows and the decisions and the beliefs that we've in, you created out of our experiences and then we continue going. And it messes up our sense of timing with God and the purposes of God because what Zechariah had done, he's like, he's looking at it and he's going, okay, so old people don't have babies. Or he goes, I'm praying for a baby. Righteous people get babies. We didn't get the baby, so maybe I'm going to struggle a little bit. So he starts making up decisions. So when the angel of the Lord came to him and was like, hey, it's time for this to happen, it violated this whole list, of, this whole process that he went through. And I, I want to let you know that God wants to violate this whole process for you. God wants to do the impossible in our lives. You think that the only option in your life is to live a life of unforgiveness, but God is inviting us to forgive as we've been forgiven. And the goodness and the glory of God wants to appear to you so that he could break this cycle over your life. 
You think that the only option is to, because you've been longing to get married, maybe if you're single and you're like, oh man, it's just taking so long. I'm just going to have to settle or marry some jerk of a man. Or maybe there's not a God-fearing guy who's a single Christian. And and, and God's going to fail me on this issue. And I'm just going to have to either go it alone the rest of my life. Or I'm going to have to marry somebody who's subpar and not be equally yoked and not marry somebody else who believes like I do or wants the same things that I want in life. And God wants to blow up this entire paradigm and say, Trust me and my promises, not your experiences. This is the invitation in the Advent season. In the midst of waiting, in the midst of the longing for something different than it's been, to trust God that he's making all things new. I've been talking to, I mean, out of my own life. I've been sharing with people that we, we oftentimes live out of our flesh and our experience instead of, out of, instead of out, of, out of our inheritance. I live out of my flesh and my experience, not out of my inheritance, meaning this. I live out of what I understand. I live out of what I know. I live out of what I've experienced. I live out of what I've shaped, out of what I can control, out of what I can influence, instead of receiving the promises of God for my life and trusting him that he's making me new every single day and that the latter will be greater than the rest. That in God I can be transformed and and I can think different and I can believe different and I can feel different. That there's hope for my life and hope for your life. That there's hope for this city. God is inviting us to trust him and to believe him and for our words to line up with what we believe. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're like, I don't even know how this, I don't know how this is going to come to pass. But God, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to talk to your people and I'm going to seek understanding and I, my words are going to align with the promise. This is something that God wants to do, but I'm not sure how it's going to happen. Choose the language of Mary. How are you going to do it, God? How do, you, how do you want to do it? In this time of Advent, we spend a lot of time reflecting on their lives and looking at their response to God. But there's a response that we can have to God as well. God promised in John chapter 14 through Jesus that he was going to come back. Now, now, when you hear about Advent, looking at the promises of God in the past and his faithfulness, and then looking to Jesus' return, when you hear about Jesus' return, you might go, a few different directions. You're thinking of like a, a black background website with white words and fire and unicorns, right? Have you ever stumbled on those pages? No? You study like, es- the word is eschatology or the end times. And, and it's, a, it's a big word for basically what will it look like when Jesus returns, trying to make sense of the book of Revelation, trying to make book, uh, sense of the book of John, and trying to figure out what's it going to look like. I think it's going to look very unlike uh, uh, most of us expect. But the idea is that, that is sometimes we can, it can be so invisible or so weird that we don't even think about the fact that Jesus is coming back. But in this Advent season, we remember the promise of God that he is coming back and there's things that we can do to prepare as well. The way that we prepare ourselves to walk with God is to humble ourselves. To engage in the pursuit of knowing him. To trust him with our lives and to follow him. To take on his value, his lifestyles, his lifestyle and his, and his, um, and his purpose in the earth. 